Well, to be honest, it's a big honor for me to be here today, uh, here joining in this celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Villanova Physics Department. And if you think about 1938, that was the year that Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch discovered that uranium nucleus can decay. And 2013 is the year where, well, we're not sure yet, but it may be that we have observed the Higgs boson, an ephemeral, ephemeral particle which plays a profound role in giving mass to other particles in the universe, and as I'll describe a little bit later, uh, maybe determining the ultimate fate of our own vacuum state of the universe. And it's a real honor to, for, to, take, to witness uh, this induction into Sigma Pi Sigma. Yeah, for all of you who have been recently inducted, uh, congratulations. It's a, not, a great, not only a great honor, but uh, for us, in the physics community as a whole, it's meaningful to us because you are our future. You're going to determine what happens in science in the 21st century. And um, with that thought in mind, I want to leave you with two pieces of advice. Um, number one, uh, whatever you choose, be passionate about it. Uh, when you if you end up in science, science research, for example, don't choose a problem because it looks, it's, looks like it's cool or because your advisor chose it. Choose something that you really, really are passionate about, that if you find the answer, you're going to really care. Because science is difficult. It's challenging. Uh, it challenges you at every turn, and sometimes, well, to be honest, it can be quite frustrating. But when you get to the point that you actually make progress in it, and it's something that you're passionate about, all that challenge and frustration part completely melts away, completely fades from memory. And what you remember is the fact that you've actually contributed to something that you're passionate about. And the second piece of advice is be bold. Um, it's very easy to take authority uh, in science too seriously. But progress in science depends upon you, the next generation, challenging authority, showing that uh, somewhere along the way we've made a big mistake, that the emperor has no clothes. Uh, so we depend on that, and that requires that you be bold. And I tried to choose a topic today which had these two thoughts in mind as a, as a theme. It's a topic in which passion and boldness are required. Uh, the topic is the origin, evolution, and future of the universe. It's hard not to be passionate about that. That's everything. Okay. And, but in particular, at the present time, we're having an interesting debate in the field about this story. And um, there's a consensus view, an authority view, and there's a challenging view, challenger's view. So uh, there's a point here about how bold one wants to be in pursuing this issue. Um, the two theories can, uh, can be summarized in the terms Big Bang and Big Bounce. The Big Bang idea is the idea that the universe had a beginning. By the universe, I mean everything in the universe, not just matter and radiation, but space and time as well. That there was some time when there was nothing, and suddenly, for some reason that we don't completely understand, there burst a something, a space, a time full of matter and radiation began expanding and cooling. And that's what's been happening over the last 13.7 billion years. Uh, the competing idea is that, no, 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 that, that space and time didn't really have a beginning. What really happened 13.7 billion years ago was a bounce. There was a pre-existing phase of the universe, which you can think of as a kind of contracting phase, that contracted to a certain critical point, bounced, and emerged into an expanding phase. So space and time existed before the bounce, and the key events that set up the structure of the universe we observe today came from events that occurred before the bounce. So it's not just a hypothetical idea, it's an idea which has implications for the way we see the universe today. And there's no reason why this bounce should have been a one-time event. It would have, uh, in the simplest versions, it would have repeat at regular intervals, roughly every trillion years or so. So that space and time could be eternal to the past and eternal to the future. Um, so, what I want to talk about today is both of these ideas. I want to begin where the two pictures agree. So I talked about challenging authority, but you, when it doesn't challenge authority arbitrarily, you should look for the weak points in current ideas, the places where observations don't really give us enough information to be sure about current uh, consensus ideas to challenge. That would be the uh, best place to challenge. 
The two pictures that we're talking about that today agree over a large fraction of the history of the uh, past history of the universe. And they agree because essentially they're forced to. We have observations which we can use to show that this is the this had to be so. So what they po two pictures agree is that there was a time when the universe was so hot and dense that there were no atoms. The universe, all the matter that we observe today within our horizon, within the region that we can see, was compressed and heated to a point that it was boiled into its elemental constituents, uh, which means not just down to atoms, but even to the constituents of atoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And um, also during that time, the universe was extremely uniform. That is to say, the matter and radiation was spread out extremely smoothly. Uh, the variations in density or temperature were less than one part in 10,000, ranging over the entire patch that would eventually become our universe. It was flat, flat in the sense that, well, what you might imagine, space, in, uh, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, can be curved. It can be curved positively or negatively. Posi it can be curved like a sphere, or it can be curved like a saddle. It can also be flat, but that's a special condition. And that turns out to be the condition that we observe the universe to be in its early history. And how do we know all this? Well, because if there was this time when there were no atoms, when the universe was boiled into its elemental constituents, then the universe consisted of a plasma, an opaque plasma, uh, which you couldn't see through for this history, until the point that it cooled enough that the first atoms could form. When the first atoms began to form, that changed the transparency of the universe from being opaque to being transparent. And the light that was, you know, which was uh, scattering around uh, time and time again at that point suddenly found itself in a transparent universe, began streaming through the universe, and it's been doing so for 13.7 billion years since. And we gather that radiation, some fraction of that radiation, with very highly sensitive detectors, and we make an image of what the universe looked like at that early time based on the light that's been streaming from that time. And what you're seeing on the slide here is a famous iconic image from the Planck satellite experiment that reported its results last March, which shows that image of the infant universe. Or it's actually, I should say, the pre-infant, pre, the, the very, very early universe. Um, even pre-infancy, in a sense, before um, embryonic, I should, it would be a better word. Um, so just to explain what we're looking at here, it's a projection mat, just like we sometimes do for the surface of the globe. We sometimes project it into an oval. This is the entire sky projected into an oval. And the red and blue spots are false, false color um, renditions, which are supposed to represent the regions, regions which are slightly cooler than the average and slightly uh, hotter than the average, and the range in between. And the first thing to be observed about, by it is that although the false color image exaggerates the effect by you know, giving a strong contrast in colors, the difference between the hottest regions and the coolest regions is only about a few parts in 100,000. So very, very nearly uniform universe. And another feature of this, uh, of this map is that if we study this, oh, I should say, this map is very much like, if you want to make a comparison, it would be like seeing a picture of yourself 10 minutes after conception. So that would not be a very impressive picture, perhaps. You might not recognize yourself. But a scientist with the appropriate tools could have used that picture or, and gathered information from that picture to actually predict a lot of the properties that you have. In a similar way, this picture looks rather unimpressive, formless. I mean, there were no stars and galaxies and planets and dust at that time. Everything was just, the first atoms were just forming. And yet, the pattern of hot spots and cold spots there contains a lot of valuable information which allows us to predict <coughs> and explain what's going to happen to the universe next between then and now. So in particular, one of the properties of this pattern of hot spots and cold spots is that they form what we call a scale invariant distribution. That's a fancy term for the following thing. Suppose I look at all the spots of a certain size. Some are hotter than average, some are cooler than average. I discover they form a bell curve-like or Gaussian distribution around the average value. I then go to spots of a bigger size. I find they, find also find they find that they also form a bell curve-like distribution of the same type as the smaller spots. 
And if I yet look at bigger, spot, Scott, bigger spots still, no matter what scale I choose, I find the same distribution. That's what we mean by scale invariant. That's a very special arrangement of hot spots and cold spots. That's not, for example, what you would get if you were boiling some water and just random and looking at the random fluctuations in the temperature on the surface of the water. It's a special distribution of, uh, of, of spots that calls for an explanation. And we'll come back to that in a bit. But given that set of hot spots and cold spots, even though they're extremely tiny, only small differences, it turns out one can learn a lot about what's going to happen next in the universe because those, are the those slight differences are what eventually account for all the structure we observe in the universe. All the stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and superclusters originally had, were born as these slight differences in density or concentration of matter. So if you now just begin with this as an, as an initial condition, for, uh, as, your initial, as your starting point, and go forward and just let gravity do its thing over 13.7 billion years, it will take these tiny differences and it will begin to draw matter towards the regions which have higher density to begin with and away from the regions that have less density to begin with. And it will continue to do this more and more, concentrating more and more matter in, in regions of high density, drawing more and more matter regions from low density, and, well, actually, uh, we don't just have to uh, uh, assert that this accounts for the structure we observe today. We can actually run the simulation. We can take what we observe from the radiation, this microwave background radiation that was making that initial oval that I showed you. We can use that information as input, as way uh, 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 input into a simulation that simulates the action of gravity on the matter in the universe. And that's what this simulation is going to show beginning with a nearly uniform universe. It's counting forward in time and gradually going to transform itself from a nearly uniform universe. You see matters being drawn in, and con concentrated uh, by gravity into regions of high density and away from regions of low density. And what we end up is with a pattern of filaments and voids which agrees remarkably well with the data that we observe when we actually physically look out in the sky and map the distribution of galaxies in the sky. So we can actually compare <coughs> uh, our simulations, which begin from this data about what were things were like at the beginning, run it forward in time, and match what we observe. So. <coughs> um, the th two theories also, Big Bang or Big Bounce, also agree on the current composition of the universe. This is again something that can be measured through a combination of measurements of this mic early microwave background radiation and the distribution of galaxies. So they both agree that the matter that we're familiar with in our everyday lives, the matter that, com that, that uh, comprises us, that comprises the dust, stars, and everything we see in the sky, all that matter only com comprises a very small fraction, less than 5% of the total stuff or total energy of the universe. We call this stuff ordinary matter because it's the kind of matter we're familiar with. Uh, at one time, we believe that everything, in fact, many of you may still have learned in school that everything is made of atoms. 4.6% mm -mm. of the universe is made of atoms. The rest of it is made of something else, which, whose identity we don't really know. We know the rest of it, though, comes in two dramatically different types. About 22-23% 20 of it consists of something called dark matter. Dark matter shares a property with ordinary matter that if you put lumps of dark matter in space, <laughs> they gravitationally attract one another. They tend to clump together. In fact, in the, what you were seeing in that simulation, was actually the dark matter that was coming together, clumping together through the action of gravity. Because it's the action of dark matter, which is much more, which far, you know, it outweighs the ordinary matter, which is the prime driver in driving matter together to form the gravitational potential wells in which galaxies eventually form. So in fact, there if there were no dark matter, if there were only this ordinary matter, there would be not enough matter to make even one galaxy today. So we wouldn't be here today unless there were the dark matter there adding to the total mass of the universe and helping cluster matter together. So, we owe, so sometimes people say, ask the question, how do we know this dark matter exists? 
we actually have many lines of evidence, which I'm not going to talk about today. But the most important line of evidence is the fact that we are here today to talk about dark matter. That depends upon dark matter existing. We wouldn't be here without it. Yeah, so uh, black holes would, uh, would probably be uh, classified, well, it uh, depends upon where they are, but they would be somewhere in this, they could be classified somewhere in the combination of these two. There's maybe some combination of the two. Then there's this majority, the 73%, which we actually, even though it's 73% of the stuff in the universe, it's the most recently discovered contribution to the story. And this is wh what we call dark energy. There's a reason why um, uh, it's, been, it's the latest to come, uh, and that's because it gravitates in a very different way than ordinary matter or dark matter. Whereas ordinary matter and dark matter have the property that they gravitationally attract one another, dark energy has the property that it gravitationally repels itself. So if any of you ever learned that gravity always uh, attracts or that gravity sucks, as we sometimes say, okay, then uh, you should know that actually in, that may have been true of Newton's theory of gravity, but when Einstein revised Newton's theory and developed his general theory of relativity, one of the implications of that theory is that it's possible to have forms of energy which gravitationally self-repel. It was considered hypothetical, it was considered something you should, you know, some, just a fanciful thing that could be a consequence of the theory, not necessarily relevant for a real universe, and lo and behold, it turns out by the end of the century, we discovered that most of the universe contains this stuff. And if you fill most of the universe with this stuff, one of the properties it has, because it self-repels itself, it tends to speed up the expansion of the universe. That's in fact a way of detecting its existence, by observing that the universe is speeding up in its expansion. Whereas if it were composed only of dark matter and ordinary matter, which are trying to resist the expansion in the universe and trying to draw together, we should see that the universe is slowing down. But measurements made in the 1990s established and, and verified since, redundantly have verified since, that this expansion of the universe is speeding up and that most of the universe contains energy of this self-repelling type. What's going to happen in the future? Well, this Big Bang and Big Bounce idea give you two different pictures, or two dramatically different pictures. The Big Bang picture, in the simplest version, proposes that this dark energy is just beginning its job and will continue to accelerate the universe forever. As it does so, it will dilute the distribution of dark matter and ordinary matter to the point that if you were to come back in a trillion years, you would see literally nothing over the scale that we observe today. It, matter would have been spread so thinly, there'd be nothing at all to observe. The universe would be returned to perfect, pristine vacuum. And that's it. That's the long-term future of the universe. So the universe that we know with stars, galaxies, and the like is, in, some, in the cosmic sense, a brief episode between the Big Bang and this period of dark energy domination. And that's a logical possibility. In fact, that, as I said, that's the consensus picture. In the Big Bang picture, I'm uh, sorry, the Big Bounce picture, this dark energy plays a crucial role, but it can't stick around forever because if you want to have a universe which continues to bounce over and over again, it must be that this dark energy eventually decays. Decays to a form of energy, what we call a negative potential energy, a form of energy that will eventually cause the universe to contract, ca creating a new bounce, creation of new matter and radiation, and beginning the process again. So in the big bounce picture, the part of the universe that we observe will go through a period where it darkens due to the presence of dark energy, but then it will renew itself and uh, another cycle of formation of matter, stars, galaxies, superclusters, presumably life, will begin anew, and this will repeat itself at regular intervals. But that's the future. What I really want to focus on at the moment is really more the past, where the starting point was. Because where I, began, where I said the two pictures agree began with this picture, and this picture presents a striking, puzzling feature to it, which are the features I mentioned. The fact that it's uniform, the fact that it's flat, the fact that it has this very special distribution of hot and cold spots. You could ask yourself, if you just began with a Big Bang universe filled with matter, radiation, and dark energy, could you naturally explain this, this picture? Could you get from the beginning to this picture? And, um, 
The answer is no. Uh, it, it's not impossible, but it's very special and highly, highly unlikely. It's, you know, it's a violently unlikely start because when, if the universe begins in a big bang, it should emerge uh, in a sudden, violent quantum event, very high energy event, and producing a distribution of matter and radiation which is very non-uniform, and a distribution of space, uh, space itself can be curved and warped according to general relativity, it should be rather curved and randomly warped. Now, if the universe consists of only matter and, and, and radiation, dark matter, ordinary matter, radiation, the like, it turns out that they, because they resist the expansion of the universe, they slow down this expansion of the universe after the Big Bang. In such a situation, the longer you wait, the more of the universe, the more of space you see. So if the universe is full of, full of a very uneven distribution of matter and curved and warped, it should become more and more apparent the more of the universe you see. The long, uh, older the universe is, the more obvious it should be that there was this violent, random quantum beginning. But that's not what we observe. What we observe is a strikingly uniform, flat universe with a very specially prepared distribution of hot spots and cold spots. Something very unlikely. So it's for this reason that over the last 30 uh, years or so, that theorists have been trying to improve or modify our idea of cosmology to account for this strange beginning. And one of the key ideas uh, developed in the early 80s is the idea that we call inflation. <coughs> so that today, when we talk about the Big Bang model, what most astronomers and cosmologists are talking about is actually the Big Bang inflationary model in which this idea of inflation is incorporated into the picture since the Big Bang alone can't explain what we observe. So what is inflation? Well, it has a number of properties. It's, um, what it refers to specifically is that shortly after the Big Bang, it's hypothesized, there should have been a special form of energy in the universe. We call it inflationary energy as a generic term which is like the dark energy in that it accelerates the expansion of the universe, but at a much more fantastic rate than dark energy does. In, in fact, this acceleration is literally superluminal, faster than light. By that I mean is if we were right now living in an accelerated universe of this sort, and we were able to watch one another at the beginning and send signals back and forth at the beginning, within a few instants, space between us would be stretching so fast that we would lose sight of one another because the space couldn't traverse the distance fast enough given how much space was being created by the expansion. Now, if some of you are familiar with Einstein's special theory of relativity, this idea might sound, biz sound bizarre and strange, violating basic laws that you learned in school, namely the law that says that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And here I'm talking about accelerated expansion which can be superluminal, meaning faster than light. Is this a crazy idea? Well, not actually. If you go back to the law of relativity that you learned, you'll discover that actually the law is more carefully stated than the way I first presented it and the way we normally remember it. What it really says is that no object can pass at any other object at a speed greater than the speed of light. And during this accelerated phase, if any object does pass any other object, it will always be less than or equal to the speed of light. So it completely obeys that law. That's part of Einstein's special theory of relativity. That's a key, key consequence of it. But when Einstein went next to add gravity to his theory to produce his general theory of relativity, a new phenomenon was shown to be possible, which is space can stretch. Space is elastic. It can stretch, it can contract, it can bend, it can warp, it can do all the things that you think of a rubbery substance doing. And whereas there is a rule about, uh, the rule still holds about how fast one object can pass one another, there's no constraint on how fast things can stretch. So in fact, it's not too hard to imagine forms of energy which would produce the super, superluminal effect. Dark energy is an example of such a thing. Over time, when I said the universe is going to become emptier and emptier, what I was talking about was that with enough time, uh, because this stretching is faster than light, eventually you lose sight of all the billions of galaxies we see today. The rate in the case of dark energy is that the universe roughly doubles in size about once every 10 billion years. In the case of inflation, 
what one's imagining is that this occurred, there's a different period of accelerated expansion that occurred right after the Big Bang, in which the doubling rate was once every 10 to the minus 35th seconds. Okay, so remarkably faster, requiring much more concentration of energy in order for this to occur. Now, once it starts, if you imagine the universe doubling at this rate, it's an incredible rate, um, um, it doesn't take long before it becomes very big. In fact, in just after 10 to the minus 30 seconds or so, that would be a factor of 10 to the fifth or 100,000, it would have doubled in size 100,000 times. So it would have grown by a factor of 2 to the 100,000th power. So that's enough to take a region which is the size of a proton and blow it up to a size which is, well, something like, you know, 2 to the 1,000 times bigger than the farthest region we can see in the universe. So in, in this picture, what would have happened is our, the patch of universe we observe today would have been microscopically small at the beginning of inflation and been blown up and stretched at this incredible rate uh, during this brief period of 10 to the minus 30 seconds. And one of the consequences of an accelerated expansion is, unlike the case of the Big Bang where you're seeing more and more of the universe with time, because space is stretching so fast, you're actually losing sight of things. And as you lose sight of things, it looks more and more like the universe is uniform. And even if the universe had some curvature as you stretch it, it appears to be flatter and flatter. So you get the uniformity and flatness from this accelerated expansion that you get from this inflation. <coughs> and then, it, you also have to postulate this inflation area is not only there, but that it eventually, that it must decay. Uh, it better decay, because if it were still here today, this stretching would be occurring so fast that we'd still be nothing to see, not you or me, let alone stars and galaxies. Okay. Um, now, this decay process occurs through a quantum process much like the quantum process that causes uranium nucleus to decay uh, that uh, Meitner and uh, Frisch uh, ta uh, discussed in 1938. One of the things about quantum physics is that it's inherently random. If I give you a bunch of uranium nuclei, I can tell you with some precision what the mean lifetime of the uranium nuclei are going to be. But we also know that the, when, if I actually take that bunch of uranium nuclei, they're all not going to decay at the same time. Some will decay earlier and later or later than that mean value. And if you ask which ones are going to decay early and which ones are going to decay later, the answer is you can't predict. That's part of the inherent randomness of quantum physics. It's built into quantum phenomenon. And the decay of this inflationary energy is such a thing. This inflationary energy, for example, might be due to a field that permeates, permeates the universe, but which is capable of, after, through a random quantum process, of decaying into ordinary matter the stuff that makes us up and make decaying into uh, dark matter. If that's the case, and it's a random quantum process, and even though you smooth the universe out to an incredible degree up to this point, during this process of decay, you're going to introduce some non-uniformity in the universe. You're going to introduce it because there are going to be some spots in the universe that decay a little bit earlier than others, just by this random quantum decay process. And the ones that decay earlier will, begin heating up, will heat up and begin to cool, sooner than the later ones. So that'll be a cold spot and this will be a hot spot after the inflationary period decays. And it's actually not so difficult to sit down with pencil and paper and compute what distribution of hot spots and cold spots you expect to see from such a process. And the answer is it looks incredibly like, in fact we can't f find any distinction yet from, what you would get from this pattern of hot spots and cold spots that we actually observe. Uh, and from, the mo uh, from these measurements of the cosmic microwave background, from the data we've gathered. So, it appears, and it's often said in newspapers, journals, magazines, um, um, press conferences, uh, encyclopedias, that inflation has this remarkable property that you can give it arbitrary initial conditions coming out of the Big Bang, and what it's going to end up predicting from this hyper-stretching is a universe which is uniform, flat, and with this special scale invariant spectrum of hot spots and cold spots in accord with observations. No wonder it's the consensus model. But is this really true? Is this really what the model does? So often in science, it sometimes happens that we have an idea that seems very compelling, seems that it's working, but the more you study it, you discover what looks at first like small problems and they can grow into very big problems. And 
Perhaps that's what's happening in this subject. For example, the statement was that I could use arbitrary initial conditions coming out of the Big Bang. Well, what we've learned over the decades is that's actually not true. This inflation has to get kind of a, fair, a good start in order to take over the universe. And in order to have a good start, it's important that there be a patch of the universe which is dominated by this inflationary energy. It doesn't have much matter and radiation in it. It doesn't have a lot of curvature and warp in it. In fact, it's rather uniform. In other words, it requires rather special initial conditions. In fact, so special, so exponentially rare and special, that it's less likely to produce those conditions than it would be to produce the universe without inflation, as we see it. So I said without inflation, this picture is not impossible, it's just very unlikely. It's still more, unlike, more likely than producing a patch that we need to get this inflation started, at least to our current understanding. And so that's got th theorists looking to see if they can make theories of initial conditions that would give us something other than arbitrary to explain why inflation would take place. But we do not have that theory at present. More damning is the issue of prediction, because there I see much less way out. So the claim is that it makes all these nice predictions, but this, has been, this, this idea that inflation predicts all this uh, is also a, a, a matter of some debate. And the reason is because of a phenomenon that was not known at first when the inflationary model was developed. It took a few years before it was first <laughs> noticed, and it's a phenomenon known as eternal inflation. So inflation requires some start, as I just explained, but once it starts, it continues eternally somewhere in the universe. It doesn't never stops. And this eternal inflation, I should point out, results from features which you can't get rid of. It's not like it's an option. It's built into the theory. It relies on two key features of inflation that uh, are essential. It relies on the idea that inflation is incredibly fast, that a region which is inflating stretches much faster than a region which is not. So we're in a region today which is not, and a region that's inflating is going to grow in volume faster than we are at an incredible rate. For example, in the 10 to the minus 30 seconds, it will grow by 2 to the 100,000 power. In the same 10 to the minus 30 seconds, we will grow by about a factor of 30. Okay, so it grows at a fantastic rate compared to us. And the second issue is this inherent randomness of quantum physics that rears its head over and over again. Remember, those are the two features we're actually using to our benefit to explain this picture. The inflation being incredibly fast is supposed to explain why things are uniform. And the inherent randomness of quantum physics is supposed to explain why the inflationary de uh, energy decays at different times at different places, resulting in that pattern of hot spots and cold spots. But when you think more seriously about these two conditions, it leads to a different picture of how we think inflation really works. So here's how we thought inflation worked or how I described it to you initially, we imagine that there was a patch of universe that with some random distribution of matter and energy, something like this tiny Jackson Pollock painting, and then it was stretched through inflation by an incredible amount, and I can't show a factor of two to the 100,000 on, on my PowerPoint, so I'll just go with that, okay? That's supposed to represent 2 to the 100,000 power expansion. And the gray there is supposed to represent that there's still all this inflationary energy there. And then that inflationary energy is supposed to decay in a slightly non-uniform way, which eventually results in the universe, universe that looks just like the universe we observe today, full of stars and galaxies and, and dust and the like. That's how we thought it worked. But we know that isn't the correct now. Uh, it may begin with some random initial conditions. Uh, <coughs> it may undergo some period of inflation. And here I've made, I've for, uh, made it a little bit smaller this time, but it's still supposed to represent this 2 to the 100,000 power or so. Um, but when it decays, it's true there's be regions that decay at roughly the mean time of decay. But there'll also be what I'll call rogue regions, procrastinators, regions that decay at a much later time than average. I'll represent symbolically this way. The red region represents the region that decays more or less at the right time and becomes hot, full of hot matter and radiation. And the corners there, which are remain gray, are the regions which, which are left behind, the rogue regions which are left behind. I don't mean you're supposed to take that picture literally, but I'm just representing geometrically these two kinds of regions of space. 
And then what happens? Well, the region that uh, ended inflation will grow by a modest amount, during which period the region that's gray, even though it began small, will soon become an overwhelming majority of the space of the universe. So what you, what's happened is instead of producing an entire universe that looks like us, we've actually produced a pocket of the universe that looks like us. Enough to contain us, but it's only a pocket. Most of the universe is continuing to inflate away due to those rogue regions, those procrastinators that took advantage of inflation to gain a lot of volume. Now procrastinators, they wish, they nevertheless have a quantum physics at work which is going to cause them to decay. Even a uranium nucleus that takes a long time to decay will eventually decay. So eventually the decay will occur again. But again there'll be procrastinating regions that don't decay. So that just means that I'll produce another pocket with still yet more inflating space. And this will continue forever because it turns out inflation is so fast, it so outruns the formation of pockets that, you know, uh, um, the universe um, it contains almost entirely inflating space with only rare pockets in between. So this is false in the sense that you should think of the gray regions stretched by exponential amounts compared to the pockets. I just wanted to show you that it also contains a lot of pockets as well. Well, all this may not be so disturbing, provided the pockets are big enough and provided the pockets are identical, like is indicated by this picture. But here is where random quantum physics rears its head again. Because during this decay process, when, you're, when a universe is decay, when a pocket is being formed, there are all kinds of weird things that could happen that are unlikely, but in quantum physics are possible. All kinds of deviations from average behavior. And so what that will lead to is these pockets actually not being the same due to random quantum physics effects. There'll be some that look like us and they might be habitable, like the one in the far right corner over there. And they will be flat and uniform and have a microwave background like what we observe. But there'll be some which are not, which are not flat. There'll be some which are not uniform. There'll be some which have a microwave background that looks very different and some that ha don't have a microwave background at all. Some which can support life and some which cannot. And some can support life like us, but some not. <coughs> and when I said some, I, should act I was actually being quite modest. This is an eternal process, so actually it's an infinite number of every one of those possibilities. Because it can continue forever. So anything that can happen will happen, and it will happen an infinite number of times. So the real outcome of inflation is not making a universe that looks just like what we observe, but actually producing an infinite number of possible pocket universes with every conceivable physical possibility. And if, as some people speculate, there could even be differences in physical laws from pocket to pocket, the physical laws could be even different from pocket to pocket. So all the physics we've studied would be physics of our local pocket, not physics of the universe entire in such a picture. <coughs> Welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> of course, that's not what it's usually called. It's usually called the multiverse. So when people talk about the multiverse, they're referring to the possibility that due to inflation, instead of guests getting a universe that's like what we observe, you get every conceivable possibility reproduced an infinite number of times. But to me it is a nightmare because what this means is that a theory that was supposed to be powerfully predictive isn't. Inflation has produced everything, every conceivable physically allowed possibility. It's produced pockets with every conceivable possibility and it's selected nothing. There's nothing in this picture that tells you which is more probable. There's no statist inherent statistical measure to the story that tells you which thing is more probable than anything else. So all predictive power, so far as inflation is concerned, has been lost. Now hold it. Some of you will say, I've heard in the newspaper a recent uh, Planck satellite experiment in March. They reported the results and they say they agreed beautifully with the inflationary predictions. What is Professor Steinhardt talking about? Well, yes, they actually did make such claims and it's, I hear them repeated often even by my colleagues. But what they don't tell you, unless you ask them directly, they don't tell you is that they conveniently omitted to include the multiverse in their thinking. They conveniently omitted to include the fact that once inflation has started, it becomes eternal. Because then, of course, they would have no prediction to compare to. So they just left that discovery out of the story, went back to 1982, our understanding of inflation before we understood that it could be eternal inflation, and compared to those, those theories. 
So that's not legitimate. We have no reason to believe that you should, that that, 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 that analysis is correct. But that's what, that's what the field is doing. Can we fix the problem? Well, actually, we've been working on, we've known about this since 1983. This is the 30th anniversary of the discovery of eternal inflation. So, yes, people have been working quite hard to try to see if we can fix the problem. Uh, one way they've tried to fix the problem, we, I should say we have tried to fix the problem, is to see if we could add to our theory a principle of measure, a way of weighing one pocket universe compared to another, and then convince ourselves with, that, with a natural choice of measure ours would be the most likely, and the physics we b observe would be the most likely. Well, that program has failed. Um, the most obvious measure you might choose, for example, is uh, asking, uh, if you add up the volume, which kinds of pockets occupy the most volume, because that would be the most likely. After all, inflation is all about making volume, so you'd think that volume would be a good way of measuring things. Well, it turns out that um, we're, our, our kind of pocket is not favored, does not occupy most of the volume of the universe. In fact, any pockets younger than us are exponentially favored compared to us. The reason is, younger pockets were formed later than ours. Later than ours means there's been more chance for inflation, more volume, more place to put your younger pockets, to create your new pockets. And so there's always lots more of those compared to us. So a pocket that's even one second younger than us is something like e to the hundred times more likely than us. So if you try to introduce this, measure these kinds of me this kind of measure principle, you find you fail by a huge amount. And then all that's meant is that people have tried to come up with other ideas of measure and other ideas of measure. And so far we have not found a measure which we are preferred, which we are preferred, and the measures are now getting pretty complicated. So I think this is an unlikely fix to the problem. This has led to a certain kind of desperation. Some have accepted, uh, have, have suggested adding what we call anthropic principle or anthropic reasoning to the story. Let's bring the fact that there's, we're sentient beings and bring that into as, in, as part of the selection principle. The universe is created for us. Let's only consider those parts in which humans exist. It's a very interesting um, uh, turn in science to be, think about going in that direction. Uh, it's something that's been resisted by philosophers and scientists for several hundred years, but which frustration with this eternal universe problem has led people to think about. Um, and especially you of the next generation should think about whether you're willing to accept this kind of deviation from normal science into your thinking. Um, as it turns out, though, it doesn't really help you that much. Uh, the reason is I've already given you a hint that um, in if we... Uh, that pockets which are younger than us, even by one second, are exponentially favored. We are pretty sure, one second, let me wait a second. Yeah, we're pretty sure we could exist in a universe that was one second younger than we were, right? Than we are. But there's exponentially more of those than us, and actually more volume than, than that than us. So even this doesn't help. And so that's just driven people to think of other ways of combining measures and anthropic reasoning to try to create some approach. And that's an approach that still some people are pursuing, although I think it's beginning to die out. That's led to a yet a different mode of thinking. Some would say we should simply lower our expectations. We're expecting too much from science, they would say, to expect that we would be a typical region in such a universe. We should just ex be happy with the fact that there's some place in this universe in which we could live. By low ex so that although we spend a lot of time studying physical laws, we should just accept the fact that we're just measuring something our, about our local environment, if you like, our local pocket, and it may not in any sense be typical or average or representative of the universe as a whole. It's quite a dramatic change from our usual amb ambitions in physics. So I think one of the big issues in science generally that's not just going to face cosmologists but will come to visit um, science generally is whether we're willing to accept this pattern of, of re reasoning. Anthropic reasoning, bringing the anthropic principle in, or lowering our expectations for science based on our faith, based ultimately on what is our faith in the Big Bang inflationary picture. So I'll tell you my own view on this. I think it's hogwash. <laughs> Premium, maximum quantity hogwash. <laughs> okay. 
I think that uh, my own view is that uh, what we're observing is a situation in which a beautiful idea, what seemed to be a beautiful idea, this idea of Big Bang inflation, seemed to be working, turned out not to work under the rules of ordinary science. And rather than back up, what we're doing is we're modifying the rules of ordinary science. And I don't see a reason to do that. Uh, based on just this one example. I think it's what we sh need to do is reconsider where things failed and start again. And see if we can come up with a competing idea. Um, because the present theory, the present idea is in some sense not falsifiable. Understand, since anything is possible, no matter what you would observe about any physical law or anything in the universe, that can happen somewhere in the multiverse. And so you can never falsify such a theory. So that, to me, is beyond the bounds of science I'm interested in. And so I think it's important to try to start again. And if you're going to start again, the way to do that is to go back to the theory that, f that worked best up to that point and tr examine its assumptions and see if, you, you know, if you would you're going to have to give up one or more of those assumptions in order to get out of the trouble. Now, in the case that we're talking about, there really weren't that many assumptions. There was the assumption that the universe began in a Big Bang in some random quantum state and that we needed something to smooth the universe out, to explain what we observe. So there's not much there to give up. One possibility is that the universe didn't begin in a random quantum state, that there's something about the nature of quantum gravity that we don't yet understand, that when the universe emerged, it somehow began only in a special state. It was highly likely to begin in a special state, like what we need to explain things. That's a logical possibility. I don't see a hint of that at the moment in our present understanding of quantum gravity, but it's early days. It's something that's worth looking for. The other thing we can give up is the statement that the Big Bang is the beginning. If it's not, if it's not the beginning, there has to be something that preceded it. And since the Big Bang, the universe was small, and you have to get something that precedes it, well, that naturally leads to the idea of a big bounce. So that's a part of the compelling reason for thinking about a big bang, bounce. So the way we can think about the big bounce is that today we're somewhere over here. We expanded from some be what, what, what we thought was the Big Bang. But if we really checked going backwards in time, we would discover that prior to our, our phase of the universe, there was another phase of the universe that underwent a period of expansion and then contraction, bounced, and then began again. In the most dramatic version of this, this bounce wouldn't be a one-time event, but would repeat in the future, forever in time, and would have repeated in the past, forever in time. Why is such a thing promising? Okay, well, so you, uh, conceptually I explain we're trying to give up an assumption. Let's see if it looks promising. There are several reasons, wh reasons why I think it is. Uh, the first is that before we thought inflation was the only conceivable, conceivable way of smoothing out the universe, um, and making it flat, but actually contraction is another way, this contraction approach is another way of smoothing and flattening out the universe. So in a cyclical universe, if you go back a cycle ago, the universe would be like it is today, full of stars and galaxies, and with dark energy beginning to take over the energy of the universe. Continue that forward a trillion years, and I said you would have a universe in which the dark energy has taken over completely, leading the universe to a nearly pristine pristine vacuum state, smooth, flat, empty, except for the dark energy. Then in, this, in, in, uh, in the big bounce picture, this dark energy would be unstable, S vaguely similar to the case of inflation. It would be unstable and it would decay. Um, and during this decay process, it would produce regions of the, it would produce a universe which is now contracting instead of expanding. And the ex accelerate expansion and convert a contraction, leading to a bounce. Um, if the energy that occupies, if this dark energy which decays um, is of the right sort, this is this like an inflation, we had to choose a so-called inflationary energy. Here, if the dark energy decays to the, a right sort of dark energy, it will produce a kind of ultra-slow contraction. And if you con contract the universe ultra-slow, it will preserve the uniformity and flatness of the universe that was created during the dark energy period. So by the time you bounce, it's still uniform and flat. And then when you emerge from the bounce, in what we thought was the bang, you're already uniform, you're already flat. You already have the conditions that you wanted for the uniformity of the universe. A second reason for 
why this is promising is that this makes predictions, makes real predictions, which are consistent with the data we have at present. Inflation is not the only theory that does it, that is, capable, that is conceivably capable, capable of doing it. Um, so I mentioned before the Planck satellite experiment and there are other experiments that have been measuring this distribution of temperature and radiation in the universe, these hot spots and cold spots. The Planck satellite experiment of the European Space Agency is the most recent one to report last March with the most accurate map to date. Um, in the inflationary model, we said the, way, the source of these hot spots would be due to the fact that the inflationary energy in different regions of the universe would decay at slightly different times. In a contracting universe, there's a similar quantum effect. As the universe is ultra-slowly com contracting, different regions, due to random quantum effects, will slightly get ahead of other regions leading to some regions bouncing before others. So they will bounce and begin to expand and cool before others. This will lead to a distribution of hot spots and cold spots. And even though this physics doesn't sound anything like inflation, inflation is ultra-fast expansion. Here we're talking about ultra-slow contraction. It turn and even though the mathematics behind it are, um, uh, the, the physical laws behind it are quite physical, conditions behind it are quite different. It turns out the mathematical equations are remarkably similar looking and they lead to almost the same outcome to such a degree that we can't yet distinguish the two outcomes. In fact, it's not, that's not quite accurate. The da latest data from the Planck satellite experiment is actually inconsistent with the simplest models of inflation. If we write down the simplest models of inflationary energy, which it's part of the story I haven't given the details about, but if we write down the simplest examples of inflationary energy that people have known about for years, those are now ruled out by the Planck satellite data. And we now have to get to more complicated models. The main driver, the main reason why the problem with the, simpl with the simplest models is that the simplest models don't just produce variations in temperature and density, but they also produce something, another effect, which is they produce a spectrum of cosmic wavelength gravitational waves waves that, uh, of distortion in space and time, which are very weak, but, de but would be, should be detectable, should have even shown an effect in the cosmic microwave background, and should be propagating in the universe. But that, they haven't shown up yet in the data, to such a level that we're forced away from the simplest models of inflation. We have to go to more exotic ones with more degrees of freedom, more parameters, in order to fit inflation within the current data. Now, in the theory of the contracting universe, it turns out you don't produce any significant gravitational waves because instead of producing this effect during a period of very high energy expansion, it's with ultra-slow, gentle contraction, and that doesn't produce any of these violent waves to the universe. So, at the moment, you know, uh, as, of this, as of today, as of, as of the induction ceremony, I think it's fair to say that the current data is inconsistent with the simplest models of inflation, but so far consistent with the simplest bouncing models. This could change radically, even tomorrow. Someone could announce tomorrow they've now seen these gravitational waves in microwave background through this experiment or other experiments, and that would rule out the bouncing models in favor of the, inf and, and leave behind the possibility of the inflationary models, or at least you'd have to solve the problems of the inflationary models. But at the moment, this is the current state of affairs. A third reason why this is promising is because whereas inflation leads to this eternal inflation and this fundamental unpredictability, that does not happen in a contracting, a universe that smooths itself through contraction. You remember why it happened in inflation? It happened in inflation because we were trying to smooth the universe out through this very rapid inflation process. There would occasionally be a rare fluctuation that delayed the end of inflation. And those regions, those rogue regions that were delayed, were rewarded with huge amounts of volume. Okay, here the analog is you're contracting. And there'll be some random fluctuations that will cause some region to delay their contraction. Whereas other regions will bounce and begin to expand. But now the rogue regions are not expanding, they're contracting, they're shrinking, and they'll be eaten up by the regions that bounce and behave. So in this case, instead of rewarding the rogue regions we're, and the procrastinators, we're rewarding the regions of space that behave normally, that behave on average. So instead of getting a multiverse like this, everywhere in the universe, virtually everywhere in the universe, we consist of a universe which all has the same properties, presumably the properties that we observe in our own uh, patch of the universe, which seems to be 
so uniform, which seems to be so, um, so smooth. So instead of a multiverse, you end up with a universe. Finally, um, and this is much more speculative, there's a int potentially intriguing connection to the discovery of the Higgs. So this being 2000, whoa, did I do something? <laughs> did I say something that caused that? <laughs> Okay, this is a very intriguing connection to the discovery of the Higgs. <laughs> and I thought this was appropriate since this is 2013, which it might be maybe the year in which the Higgs has been discovered. Uh, what I'm talking about is the discovery of a new particle called the Higgs boson at the European Center for Nuclear Research, a 27-kilometer ring which accelerates protons at an incredible rate of speed. They go about uh, around the ring about 11,000 times a second in which there are two detectors, one called ATLAS and one called CMS, each of which reported uh, in the last year the discovery of uh, this new particle called the Higgs boson. It's a remarkable, if true, it's a remarkable breakthrough. We've been, the idea of the Higgs boson has been speculated about since the 1960s, but it's so ephemeral, so difficult to detect, that it took this kind of fantastic project in order, in order to detect it, and perhaps we have. Now, the Higgs uh, that they're talking about is a particle, the Higgs boson. It's a particle which is produced in an atom smasher, in a proton smasher, really. But it's part of a bigger story in which there's a Higgs field, a field which permeates the universe and which contributes to the vacuum of the universe, the dark energy of the universe, um, and was th exists everywhere in space. And one of the things we're interested to know is if this Higgs boson exists and there's this Higgs energy con contributing to the vacuum of the universe, what does it say about the stability of the current vacuum of the universe? Is the universe going to stay in its current state forever or is it going to eventually decay? Well, all this depends on a lot more than we presently know at the LHC. It depends upon what kinds of other particles exist besides the Higgs boson. Now, the LHC was supposed to, when it turned on, to discover lots of new particles, not just the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is all we've seen so far. And so it's legitimate to speculate that when the, the LHC turns back on again in about two years and begins at a higher energy, it might discover new particles, and that might change the story I'm about to tell you. But at the present time, all we've seen is the Higgs boson and, 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 and all the other particles we knew about before. And that the, the simplest interpretation of that is that physics is described by something that's been known for years as the standard model. And if physics is described by the standard model, we now have enough information to predict what will happen to the vacuum of the universe in its future, whether or not it will remain in its present state forever or eventually decay. It depends upon measuring two parameters. One is the mass of a quark known as the top quark, and the other is the mass of the Higgs. Both of these are being measured at the European Center for Nuclear Research at this Large Hadron Collider that I was showing on the previous slide. So in this graph, it turns out, you know, depending upon what value, what combinations of these two masses you measure, you might have discovered that you were in a range of instability. A range of instability would mean that, according to the standard model, the universe would have decayed long ago. And if you had discovered the data were there, if, that's, if X marks the spot up here, you would know the standard model had to be wrong because we are here measuring the Higgs. So it couldn't be that unstable. So that's would be, that would be very, that would have been very interesting to find the value there. That would have been proof that there must be something beyond the standard model. But that's not what we found. There's a huge range of stability where we would have learned relatively little other than there was a Higgs boson, which is very interesting, but we've learned nothing about the vacuum of the universe, except that so far as the Higgs is concerned, things are stable. But where the data happens to lie is in this intriguing zone of what's called metastability, between instability and stability, which means at the moment things are stable, but it can't remain there forever. Okay, eventually it's going to decay. It's protected by an energy barrier, a relatively small energy barrier from, detecting, from decaying right at the moment or in the foreseeable future, but eventually it will decay. And that's very interesting because in the, stand, in the Big Bang inflationary picture, there's absolutely no reason why for that to occur. In fact, this general speculation is that it will expand forever. But in the cyclic model, it's absolutely required that the current vacuum decay. If it didn't decay, you could never reach the next bounce. So it's a prediction 
that there should be some kind of metastability. There's not a prediction that it has to be the Higgs field that causes it, it could have been some other field, but the fact that the Higgs is showing perhaps some sign of this metastability would be a profound consequence for about the future of the universe and strongly point to this something like a cyclic possibility. So it's too early to say, that's the fun part of science, sometimes you get little hints from the data that point in a certain direction, but you have to wait for more data to come and more ideas to come. But at the moment, there are these various reasons to consider the Big Bounce possibility as an intriguing alternative to the standard Big Bang picture. That it provides an alternative way of smoothing the universe and flattening it. That it's able to produce those hot spots and cold spots, at least so far as we presently know, consistent with the recent Planck data. That I think most important, that avoids this eternal smoothing, so that means you don't end up with a multiverse. You end up with a theory that really makes predictions which makes it vulnerable, but at least, at least that's a kind of science which I understand better. And it might have this intriguing connection to the discovery of the Higgs. As I say, we don't know yet at the moment which kind of universe we live in. Uh, a Big Bang multiverse or a Big Bounce uh, universe? Um, uh, a universe which has all these odd characters in it uh, and uh, is eternally uh, inflating? Or a universe which is uniform, that what we see really is representative of the universe as a whole. Uh, if you were to ask me to guess which of these ideas was correct, I would say neither. I would say that we're still early days for trying to understand the universe, and that whereas I have reasons to be very concerned about this direction, you know, it's still early days to be sure that the cyclical idea is correct. And what's probably going to be the correct idea as we enter the next century is going to be an idea that's going to be invented by someone who's very passionate and very bold and maybe even someone who's sitting in this audience. Thank you. <laughs>